Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a brief review of how to set the capital charge for market risk for FRM candidates. This is from the assigned chapter, that's Capital Allocation Chapter 14, from the book Risk Management. In the previous two screencasts, I've reviewed the risk-adjusted performance measure called RAYROC. RAYROC is short for Risk-Adjusted Return on Capital. And we also saw earlier that it's really a return on equity measure where the denominator is economic capital. And this begs the question, how does the bank determine economic capital? But let me remind, we want to distinguish between regulatory and economic capital. Regulatory capital is the rules that are set externally. That is, country supervisors and the rules in Basel II require the bank to hold regulatory capital. That's externally mandated. Economic capital is internally determined. The bank determines, presumably in alignment with shareholder objectives, what the right equity cushion should be against market, operational, and credit risks. And so how do we do the economic capital? Well, several approaches, but the approach here given by Mikkel Crowey et al., and is show, illustrated here, and again, just for the market risk bucket, not for the operational and credit risk buckets. Those risks are real. Economic capital must be held against credit and operational risk, but that's not determined here. Here is just the market risk. I'll start with an assumption that the portfolio value is $1 million, and then an assumption that I made up that the daily volatility is just shy of 10%, so that in dollar terms, if I multiply that almost 10%, or that really 9% times the portfolio, I get a dollar volatility or dollar standard deviation of 90,000. I picked that number so I could end up here with a rounded value at risk. That's all for that. Then there is a confidence level as usual. Per the value at risk of our approach, we select the confidence level. I selected 99%. Then what I did here is, instead of using the normal distribution, I used the student's T distribution. I do that only to remind that we don't need to use the normal distribution. There's been a lot of heat lately directed at value at risk and the so-called Gaussian distribution. But we have always known that we don't need to use the normal and that asset returns are fat-tailed, in which case the normal is not really appropriate. Rather, we typically learn the tools with a normal distribution. Then we know they're not going to fit in the real world. So here what I did is I'm using the student's T distribution with 99% confidence and 10 degrees of freedom. The student's T is symmetrical like the normal, but it has fatter tails. And so at 99%, I get 2.76 instead of what the FRM Canada is used to seeing, which is 2.33. It's a higher number for the fatter tails. And so this is telling me that with 99% confident, I don't expect a random variable that behaves according to the student's T or is characterized by the student's T distribution to exceed 2.76 standard deviations. So that if I multiply the dollar volatility by my critical T value, I get a value at risk at 99% confident of $250,000, meaning on a daily basis, I don't expect to lose more than $250,000 with 99% confidence. So as I'm sure you know about the VAR, it doesn't mean that's our worst case scenario. We fully expect in 1% of the 1% of the outcomes for this to be exceeded, and further, the VAR tells us nothing about the magnitude of that exceedance. So I've got my VAR at 99% confident at a quarter million. What's the period on that? It's the same period as my volatility since I haven't scaled it. So it's daily. And now to set the capital charge for market risk, according to this approach anyway, we want to set a VAR limit and a multiplier and then a couple of other parameters. So there's an F1, an F2, and an F3. And the key one here is the F1 multiplier. So this is the multiplier that will be applied or multiplied by the actual VAR outcome to determine the capital charge. 
And so you might think, well, why aren't we just using the actual VAR? That's the market risk charge. We use the multiplier. That's a way to be conservative. Specifically, it accounts for the exceptional shocks. So we're not assuming the VAR is going to be accurate. This multiplier captures the event risk that is not captured by the VAR model. And if you're familiar with Basel II, it's very similar to the multiplying factor in Basel II denoted by k, which needs to be set at least by at 3. So here's the multiplier to our actual var. Then we're going to set a var limit. And what I've done here is I took the $250,000 var, multiplied it by 2. And I'm going to say that, or just assume, this is an assumption, that internally we're going to say the var limit on this position is half a million. Again, it's 2 times the var. And now there's also going to be a modest charge. Of, in this case, I'm following Crowey's assumption. This example is all in the book. I'm going, there's going to be a modest charge for the unused VAR, whatever we don't use the VAR limit. And then importantly, there's going to be a penalty for exceeding the VAR. And so this is going to be many multiples higher than the unused charge. In this case, three. And so let's look at two scenarios here. The first scenario is where the actual VAR is 200,000. So notice it's under our VAR limit. And then a sort of semi-alarming scenario where the actual VAR is 600,000 and therefore exceeds our VAR limit. Under the scenario where the VAR is 200,000, the process here is we take the 200,000 VAR and we multiply it by that 2.0 multiplier. So you can see that really conservatively doubles the actual VAR to 400,000. Then because we didn't use all of our VAR limit, we were specifically, we were $300,000 under our VAR limit. We charge 15% against that. So that turns out to be a modest amount of 45000 in this case. We didn't go over the VAR limit, so there's no penalty. So we add these up, and the capital charge for market risk under this outcome is 445000 And you can look at this as it's a little bit over two times the actual VAR. Now, the scenario where we uh, exceed the VAR limit is 600,000, we still apply the two times multiplier. Uh, so that gets us to 1.2 million. There will be no unused portion because we've exceeded the VAR limit. And then specifically, we went $100,000 over the VAR. That gets multiplied by three for 300,000. We add the 1.2 million and the 300,000 to get 1.5 million. So you can see the charges gets to be quite severe here for exceeding the VAR limit. It's a function of the penalty. You'll notice that we're, in any scenario, we're either going to use the unused portion, the F2 charge, or we're going to use the penalty, the F3 charge, but we're not going to use both because we're either going to come under or go over. But that's the market risk charge under this approach. And so I hope this was helpful. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.